Let's just cut to the chase. Villains are some of the most fun characters we're ever going to create or experience in a story. Hell, some villains get their own cult followings, fan clubs, and movie prequels. And what do the heroes get? Activia commercials. Here's the thing, though. Not all villains can just stalk around for 40 years trying to take out Jamie Lee Curtis. Villains are diverse, rich, and complicated characters willing to watch the world burn so long as it benefits them. Think of them like that crazy purple-haired kid in your gender studies class. So then how do we pin down what makes a villain work? If they're so unique, how will we apply any general rules to writing these characters that work? Most importantly, how do we create a villain that not only obstructs our hero, but does so in a way that truly enhances the story into something memorable? To answer these questions, today we're going to go over four points to consider when making your story's villain, and how to implement them. Specifically, we'll look at my second favorite red-headed murderer, Ibaja Fowler, and his main squeeze, Heiji Shindo, from the Netflix series Blue Eye Samurai. So strap on your butt plug face mask as we plunge our way into point number one. Consider what connection your villain has with your hero, and the implications that connection has. One of the main pieces of advice you'll hear about villains is the need for them to have some connection with your hero. This advice is about as vague as a woman trying to show that she's into you. Sure, she smiled at the bar, gave you her name, went on a few dates with you, and is now the proud mother of your children. But you never know. Maybe she just needs a free meal and a place to stay. For a villain to have some connection to your hero can suggest the villain is a blood relative. Or maybe they killed one of your hero's blood relatives. Maybe they were your hero's idol, or maybe they killed your hero's idol. Maybe they're a mix of all four, like Scar from The Lion King. Or maybe they're none of these things, like the clown from It. So then, does it even matter? Should you worry about the finer details of your villain in relation to your hero, or is it all just Jaeger bombs and jello shots where no matter what you pick, it'll be a bad decision that gets the job done? Let's answer that with a story. I went to see the real Santa Claus at the local mall once, and when I found him, he was swearing at a police officer for giving him a parking ticket. Seeing some guy yelling about a parking ticket would have had no effect on me, but seeing Santa, one of my heroes, yelling about it was crippling. Now some people have said, Andrews, you were 22. You had to learn the truth sooner or later. And I did learn. I learned that Santa is an a and that realization changed who I was, because I realized my idol was not who I thought he was. So, when we think about our villain and how they are related to our hero, we need to consider the inner impact we want this villain to have towards this hero. Did our hero's idol turn out to be evil? Well, that'll cause our hero to reassess their personal code and morals. Did our hero's idol get killed by the Easter Bunny? Maybe now those same codes and morals become even more ingrained in our hero, and now they aren't sure what they're supposed to do to the Easter Bunny. See how that relationship to our hero plays out differently with just the subtlest of changes. What's cool about Ibaja Fowler is that he might have a connection with Mizu. He could be Mizu's father, or... You are, you are not! not But why does it matter if our villain is or isn't our hero's blood relative? I mean, does it really change the greater trajectory of the story? Well, yes and no. First, Mizu wouldn't be hunting these four men if she didn't suspect that one of them was her father. Second, if she knew Ibaja was her father, Blue Eye Samurai would end when he died. And third, by making the father's identity uncertain, the authors create an opportunity for the three remaining villains to work against each other later on in the story in order to protect themselves. That's wicked smart storytelling, and literally all the storytellers had to do was add a little uncertainty to their primary antagonist. But still, why have Ibaja, or any of the four men, be Mizu's father? Couldn't she just be a normal Japanese girl who hates all four men for exploiting Japan and want to bamboo chop them for being absolute crotch towels? Eh, no. And here's why. You see, by having a villain that is strictly evil, the story gets to ask a question. How is our hero going to defeat the villain? But by having a villain that is evil and also directly related to Mizu, the story gets to ask a different question of our hero, which is... The evil you hate is within you. Are you sure you're better than the monsters you're hunting? In asking this question, Ibaja Fowler remains an obstacle for Mizu to overcome, sure, but then also doubles as a moral dilemma for our hero. Blue Eye Samurai isn't just asking, 
How far would you go for revenge? It's now raising a moral question. You have the potential within you to become this evil person. Will you go too far in your pursuit of revenge and turn into the monster? When writing your villain, consider the implications their relationship to your hero might cause, and then take a step further and ask yourself what moral conflict can this villain agitate within your hero. And that brings us to point number two. Our villain mimics the hero to the extreme. Think of them as a perversion of a hero's want. To write a good villain, we need to know our hero. And I know that sounds dumb when I say it like that. So, specifically, we need to know what our hero wants. What is their main goal for the story when we strip it down to its basic one-word answer? These can be things like freedom, money, White Castle burgers, whatever. It's usually a little more tangible, something they can actually hold, or, at the very least, something external that they can acquire. Let's give an overly simplified example. You go to your friend's house, and he's got an in-home theater. You say, Wow, this is really nice. I'd do anything for a setup like this. And your friend, knowing that he's involved in a writing lesson example, turns to you and asks, Anything? Would you steal it from me? Would you murder me to have it? Would you skin me alive and wear me like an Anthony suit while you watched movies in my basement? And then you think for a second about the fastest way to get out of that house. But before you answer, your other friend Steve says, Hell yeah, I would. We have a simple want, a home movie theater, which in turn evokes a character trait of doing anything for a setup like that. And that can be taken to an evil extreme, like wearing your friend's skin like a crazy person, or it can be taken to a less insane option, like going to Walmart and buying a projector for like 50 bucks. As we see with Mizu, her reason for existence, why she has trained her whole life, why she has endured this long journey, why she kills a man with the severed femur of another man, is for revenge. Girl ain't even trying to be happy, she just wants four men she's never met to breathe a lot less. This need for revenge at any cost gives Mizu a character quality, ambition. And ambition is great. You can slap that on your resume at Taco Bell and they'll hire you right then and there. You don't even need to put your name on it. But, once we have identified our hero's main want, then reverse engineer what quality that gives her, we need to take that quality to its worst extreme. In walks Fowler. Think of Fowler as Mizu 2.0. He has gone through a traumatic childhood where he made a lunchable out of his sister's organs. He fought tooth and nail, crawling over glass and dead bodies for ten years to get where he wants to be in life. And now that he stands on the precipice of achieving everything he's ever wanted, he doesn't give a good gosh darn heckin' if he has to put a few more hundred people in the ground, pinata their innards all over the palace for a painting, or use their face to test the structural integrity of his chairbacks. Do don't care. And why that matters for our villain isn't because it makes him scary, isn't because it shows us how evil he is, isn't because some stupid third reason. It's because his evil is reflected in Mizu. Fowler is what Mizu can become if she continues to pursue her ambition at any cost. Now, if we skedaddle back to point number one, this is why it's cool to have your story villain as a blood relative to your hero. I never have to ask myself if I'll end up like that piece of shit Santa Claus. I'm not related to him, but Mizu might share her blood with Fowler. The familial relationship implies that what makes Mizu a monster isn't her blue eyes. Rather, it is her greatest strength, and what we most admire about her, her ambition. An ambition which, when taken too far, leads you to have a baby dungeon and use opium addicts as attack dogs. In your own stories, Identify your hero's greatest strength. From there, identify ways that this strength could be detrimental to your hero. Finally, take that strength to its darkest extreme, and make that the driving force behind your main villain. And that's cool and all, but then what the tits is Heiji Shindo for? If a villain's main purpose is to obstruct the hero while serving as a dark mirror, then why do we need Shindo? That question brings us to point number three which isn't so much a point as much as it is me trying to crowbar an important observation into this lesson. A secondary villain must still obstruct your main hero, but they should then serve as a mirror for your secondary hero. Now, everyone sit down, because this absolutely blew my noggin, 
and I don't think I've ever gotten this bit of writing advice from anything I've read or watched, and it's insanely smart now that I notice it. Every aspect of a story has layers. A plots and B plots, internal and external struggles, the hero's want versus their need, etc. But I was sitting on the toilet trying to figure out what the hell is the point of having Heiji Shindo in the story beyond him giving Fowler a place to live and a henchman with a face and a name. I knew he was more than that, but I couldn't figure out why. But then I remembered how he died. In stories with secondary villains, what is essentially happening is that we are making our story about two heroes' journeys. Think about it. In Avatar, Ozai is the main villain, and Azula is the secondary villain. Aang fights Ozai, Zuko fights Azula. We had two heroes. In The Lord of the Rings, Sauron is the main villain, but since he's pretty much useless beyond looking at stuff, Saruman is the secondary villain in charge of getting things done. Frodo and Sam are fighting Sauron, while Aragorn is fighting Saruman. There were two hero arcs, possibly even three if we consider Sam needing to fight Frodo. Heiji Shindo is a whiny, wimpy, pencil-necked little dweeb that I cannot stand. He wasn't good enough to be a swordsman, so he pursued the art of commerce. He is not the man actively working to create evil, he is just the man complicitly allowing evil to happen because it benefits him. Heiji is not great, in the sense that he had a great vision. Heiji is great because he is an opportunist who made a deal with the devil. When we compare that to Taigen, we see a lot of these qualities. He's an opportunist, marrying Akemi because it will give him a position of power, and maybe because he loves her. Not really sure. Anyway, when we first meet Taigen, he is smug and arrogant, thinking highly of himself because he's never been challenged by a great swordsman like Mizu. Taigen isn't even a samurai for the sake of doing anything honorable. It was just his best option rather than being a fisherman. He exemplifies a lot of Heiji's qualities. But, unlike Heiji, Taigen is honorable. He doesn't fight Mizu when she is weakened by the Four Fangs. He doesn't betray any information about her whereabouts, even after being tortured because he respects a great enemy. Hell, the guy even fights Fowler to help save Mizu despite having no fingernails. We see that, while Taigen isn't pursuing any great goal beyond regaining his title in a fight with Mizu, he is fighting against the easy way out. He is fighting against the weakness we see in Shindo to be complicit in evil and take the path of least resistance. And that's what made Heiji such a detestable villain. You see guys, you can have a villain that is a vile and disgusting human being, but that your audience still likes. Or you can have a villain that absolutely makes your skin crawl with no redeeming qualities. And that brings up point number four. Choose to humanize or dehumanize your villain and their motive. As stated earlier, Fowler had to make some hard life decisions as a kid. A decision that warped his little child mind and led him to the conclusion that he would never be in a position where he did not have complete control over his life. Sounds innocent enough considering his circumstances, right? And for a fleeting 2.5 seconds, we feel a little pity for Fowler. Now compare that to Shindo, a man who hates the smell of Fowler but takes him on orgy road trips, a man who wants his partner to die even though he's essentially the one keeping him alive. Heiji almost has a redeeming moment where he tries to have Fowler's weapons seized in port, but the second things go sour, Heiji slithers his way into the Shogun's palace to help Ibaija on his quest. And why? No, really. Why? We're never told a story that explains why Heiji is this spineless turd. We're never told a story of his brother being killed for doing the right thing. Never get a story about how Ibaija has his daughter in a dungeon in London. Whatever. He's never humanized. And while I would guess that the writers will eventually give us something to better understand this character, realize that in your own writing, what makes a villain likable or detestable is the audience's ability to understand what drives the darkest of characters to push forward. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to like the video so more people can find it, subscribe to the channel if you want more writing advice from your favorite stories, and share this video with your friends so they are a little more concerned about what you do with your free time. Holy crap, that was a long video. Oh, uh, the end.